Okay, so far we have looked at the insertion sort algorithm. We have seen how the algorithm works. And we also developed expressions for the running time of the algorithm. We develop expressions for the worst case time, which is given by k prime multiplied by n minus 1 plus k1 times n and minus 1 by t. The average case time has a similar expression except for uh, a 4 in, in place of the 2 over here. And the best case time is k prime times n minus 1. Now, if you noticed, trying to come up with ex exact expressions for these running times was a, was a little bit complicated. And we have only been looking at a very simple algorithm here, insertion sort. So if we have to do this kind of an analysis for more complicated algorithms, uh, you may feel that it's not going to be easy. So in an effort to make it easy, I'm going to describe a notation which will help us understand these running times in a more intuitive way. What we will do is as a, as a step towards simplification of these expressions, we are going to focus only on values of the running times for input sizes that are very, very large. In other words, we are going to worry about the values of t of n as n tends to infinity. And one of the reasons for doing that is, of course, uh, that in, in, in the real world, your input sizes may actually be very large. And something special happens when you go to input sizes that are that large, which is that in these expressions, as n tends to infinity, you're going to find that one of the terms is going to dominate over all the other terms. So, for example, if you, if you take this best case time here, k prime multiplied by n minus 1, well, we can express this as k prime multiplied by n minus k prime. Now, as n tends, as n becomes very large, as it tend, tends towards infinity, one of the terms in this expression for the running time, namely this term, is going to become very large. It's going to uh, contribute a huge amount to the overall value of the expression relative to the other term. Okay, so we say that one of the terms is going to dominate over other terms. And usually these other terms are going to be lower order terms. By lower order, I mean that the powers of n that you will see in those other terms are going to be lower than the power of n that the dominant term has, which is usually going to be the highest power of n in the overall expression. So k prime times n is going to dominate the value of this whole expression as n becomes very large. In a similar way, we can express the average case time here as k prime multiplied by n minus k prime plus k1 times n squared by 4 minus k1 times n by 4. Now you can see that in the in this expression the highest power of n is in this term. That highest power is 2 here. Now as n becomes very large, what's going to happen is that the value of this particular term, k1 times n squared by 4, is going to contribute more and more towards the overall value of this expression. That is the relative contribution of these other terms to the overall value is going to decrease as n becomes very large. 
in fact for very 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 large values of n as n tends to infinity the contribution of this term to the overall value is going to grow it's going to become 99.9999999 dot 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 percentage and you can verify this you know one of the ways you can verify this is look at the ratio of any other term let's say we take this term because these terms are they, they have a negative sign in front of them so let's ignore them uh, let's look at this term k prime multiplied by n divided by k1 times n squared by 4 that's going to have an n in the denominator right if you take the ratio of k prime times n divided by k1 times n squared by 4 so this 4 is going to go in the numerator this n will cancel out one of the powers here and so you basically have uh, 4 k prime divided by k1 this ratio of course is a constant multiplied by 1 by n. Now as n tends to infinity, you can see that the ratio of this term to this term is going to tend towards 0. Likewise, you know, even if you take these other terms over here, uh, and if you take their ratio to this dominant term, that ratio is going to tend to 0. So speaking in relative terms, the values of these other terms are going to they're going to decrease relative to the value of the dominant term. Even though, in, if you look at the absolute values, the absolute value of this term is going to keep growing. Right? The absolute value of this term is also going to keep growing as n grows. But um, if you look at the relative value, that's going to, the, the relative percentage of their contribution is going to tend to zero as n tends to infinity. So, when we consider the running times for large values of the input size, we will end up focusing on one of the terms, which is the dominant term. And because the other terms are going to not contribute anything significant to the value of the running time, we will simply ignore them. Right? So what happens if we ignore the other terms for the best case time here, well, it just becomes k prime times n. We are ignoring the lower order term. Likewise, if we just focus on the dominant term over here for the average case time, um, we are going to get k1 times n squared by 4. For the worst case time, we are going to get k1 times n squared by 2. So this is what happens if we look at only the dominant term. So that's the first simplification that we are going to do. The second simplification we are going to do is we are going to ignore the constant coefficients of n even within the dominant term. And the reason for doing that is the constants are going to be machine dependent. Right? We don't know what the values of these constants are. We just created this generic RAM model and we said well the you know each assembly language instruction uh, uh, can be assumed to be some constant and then you know we just group together those constants and created these other constants when formulating an expression for the running times. So the actual values of these constants is going to depend on the machine, the actual machine you use. It's also going to depend on uh, the programming language you use and uh, the compiler you use and so on. So what we'll do is, because we want our algorithm analysis to be machine independent, we are simply going to drop those constant coefficients. Right? We're going to drop the lower order terms and we're also going to drop the constant coefficients. So what happens if I drop the constant coefficients here? This just becomes n squared. This also becomes n squared. This becomes n. So what we're doing is we are uh, dropping lower order terms. 
in the first step. And in the second step, we are dropping the constant coefficients. because they are machine dependent and why do we want to ignore these machine dependent constants is it just because we don't know how to estimate their value well that's part of the reason but the other reason is that uh, you know the the, the perform the, the machines can change right so the performance of an individual machine or a particular piece of hardware um, it can change over time Right. As there are improvements in the hardware, as you get more and more powerful machines, these constants will change. But you don't want to redo all the analysis of your insertion sort algorithm simply because you're going to now run it on a different machine five years from now. So this step of simplification, therefore, is important because it allows our analysis to apply regardless of what machine you are running it on, as long as the machine approximately fits into the RAM model. So this machine independent notation to express the running time of an algorithm for large input sizes is called the asymptotic notation. So let's take an example of that. Um, well, we have already taken the examples here. The worst case p of n time can be written as so the, we won't say that the worst case time is equal to n square because um, you know it's not exactly equal to n square. We'll say that the worst case time is equal to theta of n square. So we are using this theta notation here to indicate that the worst case time is not exactly equal to n square, but it is equal to some expression where n square is the dominant term or, or the dominant term contains n square. Likewise, we are going to, we can write the average case running time as also theta of n square. We can write the best case running time here as theta of n. So this is the theta, theta notation or um, an asymptotic notation to express the running time in a simple way. So we are not going to, if somebody asks you what is the worst case running time of insertion sort, you don't have to say it's k prime times n minus 1 plus k1 times n n minus 1 by 2. You can say it's theta of n squared. The worst case running time of insertion sort is theta of n squared. The average case running time is also theta of n squared. And the best case running time is theta of n. Now we are going to get into the theta notation in more detail later. Right now I'm just introducing it in an informal way by saying that you can arrive at a theta notation for the coming time by ignoring lower order terms and ignoring the constant coefficients. Now suppose there is an algorithm whose worst case running time is theta of n square. Let me call that algorithm as A1. Suppose there is another algorithm whose worst case running time is theta of n cube. Let me call that algorithm as A2. Now, as n grows large, as n tends to infinity, the theta notation allows us to immediately pinpoint which algorithm is going to perform better at those input sizes. Because regardless of what the exact expression was for the running time of algorithm A1, and regardless of what the exact expression was for the running time of algorithm A2, we can say without knowing about that exact expression that A1 is going to perform better than A2. Because as n grows larger and larger, let's say we are plotting the running time here on the y-axis and on the x-axis we have the input sides. 
the theta of n square algorithm will um, you know the theta of n cube algorithm may look something like this and the theta of n square algorithm could look something like this okay, so this is the running time for a2 and this is the running time for a1 so as n becomes larger and larger what's going to happen is that sooner or later if theta of n square was not already performing better than theta of n cube it's possible that the curves actually could look something like this and this could be theta of n square and this could be theta of n cube <coughs> it's possible that even at smaller input sizes a1 may beat a2 as in this case but it's also possible that for smaller input sizes a2 may beat a1 right because the running time of a2 is lower than the running time of a1 but sooner or later if the asymptotic notation tells us that uh, a1 is theta of n square and a2 is theta of n cube we know that sooner or later as we grow our input size a1 will eventually beat a2 regardless of what the constants are regardless of what the lower order terms are this is something we can say for sure right because the contribution of the lower order terms is going to basically become you know 10 to 0 the relative contribution so those terms are not going to come into play when comparing the running times of a1 and a2 and as for the constant coefficients uh, you know you can you can choose any constant so let's say uh, let's say the dominant term for a2 was k k2 times n cube let's say the dominant term for a1 was some constant k1 times n square now it doesn't matter what the exact value of these constants are i can i know for sure that for large enough values of n k1 times n square is always going to be less than k2 times n cube right because uh, if i take the ratio if i take the ratio of these two terms it's going to be k1 times n square divided by k2 times n cube which is simply some constant k1 divided by k2 multiplied by 1 by n and as n grows large this this ratio 1 by n can be made arbitrarily small and therefore the product of this ratio with some other constant can also be made arbitrarily small arbitrarily close to zero so for large values of n we know that the dominant the value of the dominant term is going to be larger for the theta n cube algorithm in other words the value of the dominant term is going to be smaller for a1 and so a1 is going to perform better than a2 so this is how we are going to simplify the running times so for for future algorithms that we take up we are not going to be concerned about developing a full blown expression for the running time we are going to be more concerned about what the running time in theta notation is and that is what we are going to state as the overall running time whether it's worst case or average case or best case.